welcome Spark Fund founder and CEO Nathan Seidel. Hello, hello. I'm Nathan with Spark Fund Electronics, a company I started about 14 years ago. We have 500 products, all open source hardware. So today I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I think about open source and specifically open source hardware. Now, we produce a lot of different products with a lot of crazy customers. And this particular customer used some of our solar cells and cellular modules to track falcons all the way from Canada down to Mexico. Another one of our crazy customers took a distance sensor, hooked it to a microcontroller. That microcontroller just happened to be hooked to the valve on a propane tank. So the harder you jumped, the bigger the flame. Another one of our customers had a problem with cats jumping up on his counter. So he took one of our motion sensors, again, connected it to a microcontroller, and in this case, a, a small motor. That motor just happened to be connected to the power button on a blender, thus creating the blender defender. Now, at SparkFun, uh, as an electrical engineer, I had it just talked into me throughout school that good engineers have their names on patents. So I said, OK, which one of these 500 products should we patent at SparkFun? The closer I looked into patenting my products, the, the worse it looked. I'll give you an example. This patent was issued in the early 80s to a company called Kodak for a very broad patent for digital photography. Now, what did Kodak do with hundreds of patents across decades? Well, they sat on those patents. They litig litigated against anyone who infringed upon them, and they didn't end up in a very good place. Now, the issue is that many companies have the same mindset. They believe that it's unique ideas that are easily copied and can be sold for profit that will be. And I thought this to myself, and I was like, well, it, this is actually far too broad. There are so many ideas out there that are very unique. In this case, think about the mice. How many times has that been copied? It's a very unique idea. But pop quiz, anybody know what this is? Snuggie, haha, -ha, this is the Slanket. Even Snuggie has been copied. A very bad idea has been copied. So it's not just the good ideas, it's even bad ideas that are copied. Now, I don't know how many of you have the i6. I bought an i9, $33, <laughs> even an extremely complex device. This has Wi-Fi. This has Bluetooth. It actually makes phone calls. So even complex devices are readily copied. So that goes out the window as well. Um, Oculus Rift recently got bought by Facebook a couple years ago, a couple billion dollars. Now they have been struggling to ship the first units. I, I believe they've nearly gotten them out there. Um, this company has not had really any profit to report at all. And yet 15 weeks after Oculus Rift released their developer edition, how many of you have tried this? Right? Google Cardboard. They've shipped 5 million units of Google Cardboard just 15 weeks after a company that posted no profit released their product. So even unprofitable ideas go out the window. And let's be honest, with the internet, it's just as easy for me to sell my product in South Africa as it is to my wonderful customers in South Dakota. There is no such thing as a local market. If your idea can be sold, it will be. But wait, wait, Nate, that, that's, that's what patents are for, right? Well, it costs roughly thirty dollars to $50,000 to file that paperwork and three to five years just to get an opinion from the USPTO. That's not a yes or a no, that's just a maybe. And I don't know about you, but how much has your cell phone changed in the last three years? Right? You, you go ahead and get that patent. I'm going to go innovate. So uh, I, I also may or may not need to remind you that USPTO stands for United States PTO. And there's a lot of places that are not the United States. So I really, I don't have the time, the money, or, or really the stomach to l go litigating all over the world. So again, as I looked at the, the type of products that SparkFun was creating, I said, you know, there's got to be a different way. 
So in 2008, myself and a handful of others created this movement called the Open Source Hardware Association. And it's pretty straightforward. You provide the, the plans, the editable source files for the thing you've created, whether it's the chair or the coffee mug or the electronic device, you put the editable so source files out there. You tell the entire world that they can modify it. They can take my design, do whatever they want with it, and they can even sell it for actual dollars. Now realize, this is going to happen no matter what. If you release a product into the world, it will be reverse engineered, it will be modified for easier manufacturing, and it will be sold. The only difference between what is going to happen and open source hardware is that we have something called a, a prior art. So that when I release my product into the world, there's YouTube videos, there's get commit notes, there's dates on everything. So that if somebody tries to patent my product, we have prior art. It remains open. So that's what open source does. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of a really popular open source hardware project. Shortly after the nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan, they had a mass shortage of Geiger counters. So what do you do? Hackerspace got together and within four weeks had a few hundred of these on the streets gathering nuclear data so that the, the local Japanese people would have more insight into the, the radiation levels in their food supply. Uh, an example a little closer to my heart, this is a board that I designed. This is called the FIO, little microcontroller board. And like we do with all of our products, we post the Eagle files, the editable engineering files on our website. 12 weeks after we posted this product, this board appeared. Very similar. And we went, oh no, uh, this, is, this is it. This is the true test of open source hardware. Uh, it, it's basically the same board, but they, they changed the charge circuit. It's a little better, and that reset button is uh, that's actually an improvement. So rather than getting really upset, I actually went over to Shenzhen, China, and met with Eric Pan the person who had designed the blue board. And he and I sat and talked, and I learned from him, and he, we discussed the improvements that he made. I then went back to the US, looked at what he had done, and because this is open source, I took all of his improvements, made some additional ones, and this is the board that we sell today. Now, we've been selling this board for a number of years, and I just talked to Eric a few months ago and said, hey, I noticed you don't sell your board anymore. Why is that? He said, well, it never sold very well. That's really interesting because our board sells exceptionally well. Now, the only reason I, I can think is that we have a phone number. We have customer support. If you order it from our website, we can ship it to you anywhere in the US within 24 hours. And we have really good documentation online. So it's not just about the, the price or the, the feature set. It's all of the business principles. And that's why I'm so excited about open source hardware, right? Because it's good for humans. We have this innate nature to want to learn from each other. I want to teach you everything that I'm passionate about, and I want you to teach me something as well. But it's also really good for business, because it makes me focus on what differentiates me from Eric, fantastic guy, but how am I going to convince you, the customer, to buy from me. I'm going to provide all of those business principles. Rather than sitting on our laurels on this sort of made-up framework of intellectual property, let's compete on really good things. Let's compete on business principles. So if this is the nature of the world that we're operating in, right? This is where we're at. Global economy. I'm very much enjoying it. But can you imagine a society where we spend all the energy that we currently spend on defending our por patent portfolios or going after copycats on eBay. Imagine if we took that energy and instead invested it on something bigger, a little greater, possibly teaching. This is what I love to do. I love to teach kids how to solder because I believe in investing in the next generation of amazing hackers and technophiles. Only, that, only doing that will we really create the next awesome society. So be it hardware or software, I implore you to volunteer some time at a local school and teach them whatever you're really passionate about, because these folks are our next generation. And SparkFun pledges this, and we're taking it on the road, and we're teaching as many kids as we can about the values of open source. 
So if you'd like to hear about some of those projects or what we're doing, I'm going to be on the third floor outside the Open Source Stories Theater at 4.30. And myself and my 140 coworkers at SparkFun would love to invite you along on that journey. Thank you very much.